Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this third webinar on bilateral dialogues. My name is Vasily Octavian Mihok and I'm a World Council of Churches Program Executive for Ecumenical Relations and Faith and Order. The today's webinar is the, thir the third in a series of seven on ecumenical bilateral dialogues and their importance for the one ecumenical movement proposed by the World Council of Churches through the Faith and Order Secretariat. The webinar has two parts. The first part will focus on the history, results, and reception of the International Commission for Anglican Orthodox Dialogue. The second part will address the last agreed document of the Commission on Ecology, uh, Stewards of Creation, a Hope Field Ecology, which was published in October 2020. The World Council of Churches is organizing this new series to draw on the profound experience of those involved in bilateral dialogues who will share their processes, methodologies, results, and reception. In addition, the webinar series will bring insights into emerging issues and trends. The today's webinar will be moderated by Reverend Professor Dr. Jennifer Vasmuth. Professor Vasmuth is an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hanover. And for many years, she has taken part in dialogue with Orthodox Christians, including the dialogue between the Protestant Church in Germany and the Moscow Patriarchate, and the dialogue between the Lutheran World Federation and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Since April 2018, she has been the director of the Institute for Ecumenical Research in Strasbourg. Welcome again and greetings from the World Council of Churches in Geneva. Professor Vasmut, I'm handing over to you. First of all, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I'm glad to be here today to moderate the webinar, and that has to do with the topic, the Anglican Orthodox Dialogue, and of course, the speakers. Among the international dialogues, the Anglican Orthodox Dialogue is certainly one of the most interesting. This applies both to the documents resulting from the dialogue and to the composition of the commissions on both sides. If one does not want to go back to the Reformation, the dialogue has its roots in the 19th, early 20th centuries. Already at that time, there were contacts between high ranking representatives of both churches, which could be referred to later. The year 1973 is usually regarded as the beginning of the official dialogue when the so called Anglican Orthodox joint doctrinal discussions held its first meeting in Oxford. The first result of this discussion, also called the first phase, was the Moscow Agreed Statement in 1976, which deals with various topics, including the difficult, very difficult question of the filioque. In 1984, concluding the second phase, the Dublin Agreed Statement was published. Again, this document covered a range of topics, that is, the mystery of the church, the Holy Trinity, worship and tradition. Then in 1989, the third phase of the dialogue began, or if one likes, a new dialogue under different conditions started. The commission was now constituted as the International Commission of Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue under the chairmanship of Metropolitan John of Pergamon and Bishop Henry Hill. The focus of the conversation here was on the doctrine of the church in the light of the doctrine of the Trinity and on the controversial issue of ministry. The most important results are set out in the Cyprus Agreed st Statement of 2006. Another, if we might say, fourth phase began in 2009 with a meeting in Crete, which was followed by meetings in rapid succession. 
Out of these meetings came the important so-called Buffalo Statement on anthropology in, nine, uh, in 2015. A statement which bears the title In the Image of God, a hope-filled anthropology. Then in 2020, the document on creation theology was published, which we will discuss in more detail later. We will now hear about the history and the most important results of the dialogue from our speakers, whom I would now like to introduce in due brevity. It is a great honor for me to welcome His Eminence Metropolitan Astenagoras of Belgium as our first speaker. After studies in Thessaloniki and Bosse, and pastoral work in different places in Belgium, Bishop Athenagoras was in 2013 elected as Metropolitan of Belgium and Exarch of the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Metropolitan Athenagoras is currently the Orthodox co-chair of the International Commission. We are very glad that you can be here today. The same goes for the other speaker, Reverend Dr. Richard Clark. Until recently, Reverend Dr. Clark was the Archbishop of Armour and Primate of All Ireland. After having served as Bishop in the Church of Ireland for 20, 10, 23 years, being elected as Archbishop of Armour in October 2012, he is now retired. Reverend Dr. Clark is co-chairman of the Commission from the Anglican side. So we are now in the fortunate position to hear presentations of both chairmen. We are looking forward to the presentations. His Eminence Metropolitan Atanagos, the floor is yours now. Thank you. I thank you for giving me the floor and uh, say some words about the bilateral dialogue between the Anglican Communion and the Orthodox Church, of which I am, as you heard already today, the as a, the representative of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Orthodox Co-Chair. And I have been appointed to this position by the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in December 2016. I will try to give an overview of the work done till 10 years ago, when my fellow co-chair on behalf of the Anglican Communion came in this dialogue. Let me start by saying some words about earlier contacts between the Anglican and Orthodox Christians. It is well known that during Henry VIII's reign, the English church broke all ties with the Roman Catholic Church and established itself independently. The Orthodox and Anglican churches maintained friendly, scientific and diplomatic relations from the beginning. However, these relationships were overshadowed by a wave of proselytism in the late 18th and the early 19th centuries. However, this crisis was short-lived. In the 17th century, an exchange of letters is noted between the archbishops of Canterbury and bishops from the East. One of them was Metropolitan Gabriel Severis, who was as a Metropolitan of Philadelphia the Exarch of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Western Europe, based in Venice. For example, Metropolitan Gabriel writes to the Archbishop of Canterbury, asking him to pray for the unity of the Church of Christ. A little later, there were good relations between Ecumenical Patriarch Kirillos Lucaris with representatives of the English church, especially with Archbishop Robert Abbott and his successor. Thanks to these, and thanks to the good context that uh, they had both, 
Mitrofanis Kritopoulos, supporter of Lucaris, was sent to England to study. And this was also the case for the great chancellor of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, Archimandrai Nathanael Konopios, who is said to have taught the British to drink coffee. And some years later, there was the establishment of the Greek College in Oxford from 1699 till 75, which offered the possibility to Greeks to study at a famous university. These and other contacts have led to the founding of a publishing house known as the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge, which has produced many works on orthodoxy. But there were also English people who visited orthodox regions and left writings about them. Just think of Paul Rico. Notably is also John Mason Neal, who in the 19th century wrote books about the life and the worship of the Orthodox Church, books that have a certain value to this day. And Ecumenical Patriarch Gregorius VI has sent quite a few letters to Orthodox bishops asking them to grant the celebration of intermarriage. These are actually the first notable contacts between Anglicans and Orthodox. But later there were also contacts with Orthodox representatives of other patriarchates, such as those of Alexandria and Jerusalem, of Moscow and Romania. The first Lambeth Conference in 1867 talked about the unity of the churches. Since the sixth Lambeth Conference in 1920, Orthodox representatives have also been invited. The Orthodox delegates were those who already participated in official and unofficial bilateral dialogues between, between the Anglican Church and some local Orthodox churches. It was the time when a lot of Orthodox immigrants came to settle in Western Europe, more specifically after the Russian Revolution and the Asia Minor catastrophe. At the Lambeth Conference in 1920, the Anglicans were eager to learn why intercommunion was not possible. And the Orthodox stipulated that unity in doctrine was first a necessity and they asked them to give them the necessary time to explain. This slowly but gradually established a dialogue. And after the Lambeth Conference of 1930, a subcommission was established to deal with the relations of the Anglican Communion with the Episcopal churches, thus also with the Orthodox. The Orthodox delegation was led by the Patriarch of Alexandria, Meletios Metaxakis, and had representatives of 10 local Orthodox churches. The aim was to settle up a joint theological commission of both churches. And it was decided that this commission should be appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and by the Ecumenical Patriarch. The first Orthodox chairman was the late Metropolitan Germanos of Theatira, who was settled in London. It is only after the Pan-Orthodox conferences that took place in Rhodes in Greece that Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras I and Archbishop Dr. Michael Ramsey have established an official commission for dialogue. Its foundation dates back to 1966. This initiative was endorsed by all local Orthodox churches. The aim of the committee is to restore the visible unity between, as Archbishop Basil Krivoshein, once an eminent member of the commission, notably remarked, and I quote him, the aim of our dialogue is that we may eventually be visible 
united in one church, to which may be added that one needs to explore the fundamental questions of doctrinal agreement and disagreement of our churches. And then we come to the actual dialogue that could start, but had various phases. The initial phase was from 1962 till 1966, which mainly dealt with the resumption of dialogue. The second was the preparatory phase from 1966 till 1972, with both churches holding separate preparatory meetings. And then, as we heard, the first series of joint talks took place from 1973 till 1976. These were discussions devoted to some theological topics and concepts by way of introduction to the dialogue. The adopted texts are better known as the Moscow Agreed Statement of 1976 with topics such as the knowledge of God, the inspiration and authority of Holy Scripture, scription and tradition, the authority of the councils, the filioque, as we heard already, the church as the Eucharistic community, and finally, a difficult one, the ordination of women. Then we come to a next step, uh, talks from 1976 till 1984, with a defined interim crisis period from 1976 till 1978. And these led to the second agreed statement, namely the Dublin agreed statement from 1984, with topics as the mystery of the church, faith in the Trinity, prayer and holiness, worship and tradition. The next step was from 1984 till 2006, again linked to a period of tense and difficult years, followed by a turning point in 1990 these bore fruit in the third agreed statement, namely the Cyprus agreed statement from 2006, with topics such as the Trinity and the Church, Christ, humanity and the Church, Episcope, Episcopos and primacy, Christhood, priesthood, Christ and the Church, women and men, ministries and the church, heresy, schism and church, reception in communion. It is clear that all texts adopted have received the approval of all participants after fervent collaboration and amendments to the final text. The first two texts adopted have reached agreement on the concept of God as a trinity within an explicit Eucharistic context of the living church with the Christological and pneumatological dimensions. The Cyprus Declaration has mainly focused on the two other aspects, namely the church receives the divine love of God and the church is received as the salvation event and content of our faith. Curious about this Cyprus document, as Canon Jonathan Goodall noted, is that, and I quote him, it was conceived as a means of placing the issue of women's ordination in the context of all major theological matters and ecclesiastical considerations that could give the churches the best perspective on what kind of question it was and whether this agreement was sufficient to demand our continued sacramental separation and whether the degree of agreement offered opportunities to draw closer together despite the apparent blocking at a later stage. 
As Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams said at the press conference for the Cyprus report in Lambeth in January 2007 on the current problems between the churches. And then also the Orthodox co-chairman of that time, Metropolitan John Zizula said, neither side of the commission was convinced by the other's reason for the ordination of women. The Orthodox are not convinced that the reasons for the ordination of women given from the Anglican side are really so serious and important that they lead to this change, which as we all know, is a renewal in the tradition. Order added nothing essential to the status of women, but these topics of ordination of women and homosexuality must be treated with the utmost care so that they do not become indelible obstacles to our community. It is our practice to hold a week-long plenary session of the Commission during the course of every year. Each of the Orthodox Patriarchate and Autocephalous churches is entitled to send one delegate and our Anglican brothers and sisters on their side appoint a corresponding number of delegates. Allowing for absentees, this means that our meetings are attended by approximately 20 persons. We also have an executive committee and a drafting committee which meet as required. The Church of Bulgaria does not participate in the work of the Commission. Till today, we published until uh, five booklets with agreed statements. The general spirit of our meetings is warm and friendly, and the Anglicans on the Commission are close in their theological outlook to the Orthodox. And we are making slow but steady progress in mutual understanding. For this reason, I fully agree with the opinion of Metropolitan Callistos of Dioclea, who was my predecessor in this dialogue, who said that the Orthodox Anglican dialogue is yielding positive results and should be continued. Let me also mention that there is a good article on the dialogue published by Professor Bogdan Lubardic and uh, edited by the Orthodox Academy of Volos. And now, uh, before passing the floor to my dear brother, Archbishop Richard Clark, fellow co-chair to this commission, I would like to add some words about the different co-chairs who were mostly eminent members as the Archbishops Ramsey um, and also Rowan Williams, Bishop Mark Dyer, Bishop Henry Hill, um, Archbishop Roger Herft, and Archbishop Richard Clare Clark. And then on the Orthodox side, we had Archbishops Athenagoras of Thyatira and Great Britain, Stylianos of Australia and Methodios of Thyatira and Great Britain, and the Metropolitans John of Pergamon and Callistos of Dioclea, all from the Ecumenical Patriarchate. That's what uh, I wanted to tell you for the dialogue till 10 years ago. And now um, I think uh, Archbishop Richard Clark is going to continue. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very, very much. And now Richard Clark, I ask you for your presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've been brought really up as far as um, the beginning of the present work, which has been described rightly as the fourth phase. Now, the previous work, as we know, concluded with the Cyprus Statement of 2006, the Church of the Triune God. Now, it is a 
magisterial document in many ways. It is bulky in every sense. Um, it deals, as we've heard, with ecclesiology and with ministry. But one of the things it very definitely did was describe both agreement between the two traditions and divergence. Now, the fourth phase in which we are at present, there has been some slight shift. First of all, the subject matter is very much that of Christian anthropology. What is man? What is it to be, in other words, a human being? And we have used a slightly different method because it is not a matter of expressing agreement and divergence as much as trying to seek out and find and express a common ground. So in other words, to, to move beyond the differences on certain areas, and I rather like to describe it as being like a, a Venn diagram, that obviously there might be slightly different understandings between the Anglicans and the Orthodox over matters of anthropology, but what is the common ground, what in Venn diagram terms is the common set? And um, this has actually been very fruitful work, I believe. Uh, there are, of course, underlying all of this, different understandings of the church in that from the Anglican perspective, uh, we would certainly regard orthodoxy as part of one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, in formal terms, orthodoxy cannot reciprocate on this, but we nevertheless work together, I think, very, very strongly indeed. So what can both say? And what can both say that is worth saying and is not entirely banal? And I think the other thing I'd want to say about a common ground is that we try to find another common ground between the academic theologian and what I might describe as the engaged non-specialist. So to try and craft a language which is neither insulting the intelligence of the academic theologian, nor is it being patronizing uh, to those who perhaps are not academic specialists in the subjects that we are discussing. Um, and I think that's the first thing to say about this current raft um, of documents. Also, it was very much the wish of Metropolitan Callistos and indeed Archbishop Herft as well, that we would try and write in a succinct way. And one of the things about, and this is no criticism of the Church of the Triune God, which is a magnificent piece of work, but it is heavy in every sense. And I think what we wanted to do was to try and produce documents that were readable, intelligent, theological, but also brief. So in other words, we did not want to write uh, very long documents. We wanted them to be read, essentially. Now, this was very much the way that we went about our business. And it would have to be said, and we have um, Metropolitan Callistos, I think, in particular, um, to thank for this, that a lot of the work was actually reducing from very, very large texts down to much smaller texts. That was the way that we tried to do it, much shorter texts, much more terse, uh, and in fact, we hope, uh, much more manageable for most people. Now, the Buffalo statement has been mentioned, this one here in the image and likeness of God, um, the Christian hope-filled anthropology. And the purpose of this was to be the basis, the lodestone, the foundation, the reference point of other documents that would then follow. And now my background with this particular um, dialogue goes back to 2011. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Father Christos has been around, I think probably as we use the phrase, since Adam was a boy, he has certainly had a very, very long history uh, with these dialogues, much longer than mine. Um, as uh, Metropolitan Athenagoras was saying, he began as chair in 2016, the end of 2016. I assume the chair also in 2016, a little earlier on in the year. So um, we're talking about five years experience. I've had about 10 years on the dialogue itself. So what can we say in common 
to all Christians is really what the basis of these documents has been. And what I want to do for the few minutes I have is to really give a fairly informal perspective on the process that we have used, because I think it serves to explain the documents that then came out of these discussions, the modus operandi, if you like, for our work. Um, now, briefly, we are talking about beginning with decision on the topics we want to look at. And at present, the two topics have been stewards of creation um, and also understanding the end of life and the ethical issues uh, that may come from these. And in each case, these are rooted in, in the image and likeness of God, the Buffalo Statement. They are, if you like, the lodestone, they are the reference point for the further work we've been doing. So it begins with an open discussion uh, on the areas to be scrutinized. Um, then papers are commissioned from different members of the dialogue as chosen. And between then and over the next few months, people are asked to write papers on different aspects uh, of the subject we're looking at. Um, these are then prepared. And in each case, there would be a paper and a response to that paper from someone of the other tradition. So in other words, the papers have to be produced, given, if you like, to somebody who would prepare a response to that. And then within a few months, uh, the editorial uh, board, first of all, will have a look at both of those. But it is all a matter of people producing the papers and there being responses available to those papers in advance of the next meeting, ideally three or four months in advance of the next meeting. We meet each autumn in different venues, some of them delightful and some of them slightly less delightful, but that's not here nor there. Uh, we meet, as I say, in the autumn of each year. And then at the next meeting, there is discussion on the topic round the table. And then following that, what has been discussed um, is then edited down, if you like, synthesized down by a small group of editors by electronic communication over the following months. That follows a summer meeting between the co-chairs and the co-secretaries and the editorial group to further synthesize the work that is being done and reduce it onto the next meeting in the autumn, October usually, for further discussion and then further editing, and then a further summer meeting. It is, as uh, Metropolitan Athenagoras has said, a relatively slow process. But if you think that the um, Church of the Triune God uh, took 17 years to bear fruit, we are probably making slightly quicker progress at the moment uh, than they did, although the work was of a very different nature. So in each case, it goes from discussion to editing, to further editing in the summer, to again circulation to the members of the commission, and then discussion at the autumn meeting until we get to a final text. I think my co-chair would probably agree that not only is it exhaustive work, but it can also at times be quite exhausting work, particularly uh, to chair uh, more than 20 people, all of whom have very, very firm ideas about what should be in the documents and what should not be in the documents. So at the moment, we have two subjects on the go, if you like. Uh, the one that is now completed, which is the Stewards of Creation, the Ecology um, document, which is going to be discussed by the two co-secretaries, and then a work that we hope to conclude by this autumn, or if COVID does not permit, by the following autumn on end-of-life issues. We hope to have those completed, or that one completed fairly soon, and then to move on to what are probably far more contentious issues, although end of life issues are quite contentious, of marriage and bioethical issues. Again, they would be probably more difficult issues to resolve. So the modus operandi essentially is beginning with a broad canvas, narrowing down through papers, and then the continuing work of synthesizing down. Uh, as I've said, in the image and likeness of God was reduced 
to about one third of its original size. And this is, as I say, the, the method we tend to use. Stewards of Creation was a much easier document to work on because it was a somewhat easier document to reduce down to the essentials that we wanted to explain. The reception of them, the Anglican method is to do this through the Anglican Consultative Council, which draws together uh, clergy, laity, and uh, people from uh, clergy and laity and bishops from the, all the different provinces. Um, and it will be discussed at that. And that becomes, if you like, um, the Anglican reception as far as it can be done. The Orthodox obviously work through their different patriarchates in order to find a reception of the documents as consonant uh, with the doctrine of the church. I think that's all I'd want to say at the moment, but I'm happy to answer questions later. So Jennifer, if that's okay with you, I'll return to you. Yes, much oh, Dr. Uh, participants here to uh, raise questions, and you can do this either if, if you raise your hand or if you write a, a, a message in, in the chat. Yes, I see um, here in, in my gallery, uh, Metropolitan Zarafim of Zimbabwe. Oh, thank you very much for this initiative and for the introduction. Um, you know, uh, some years ago in the international theological dialogue between the Orthodox and the Catholics, when the, some churches failed to participate like the Russia Church, they rejected later the document of Ravenna. Now, because of problems beyond of the will of the commission, uh, because there were some differences between the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Patriarchate of Moscow, um, uh, also the Russians were not there. Now, there is any risk, again, uh, our documents not to be accepted by the, all the Orthodox like in the history of the dialogue of the Roma Catholics and the Orthodox. Uh, I would like maybe the two co-presidents know more about this. And it's a risk for the continuation of the dialogue. Thank you so much. Yes, I would like you to answer right away. If you like, Metropolitan Athenagoras. Yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we know that there are uh, tensions between the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Patriarchate of Moscow, and not uh, anymore only between both of them, but uh, also between the churches that have recognized the status of photocephaly uh, to the Church of Ukraine. Um, it's uh, very unfortunate. We had a good uh, fellow, a Russian representative in our dialogue and we still are in touch with him. Uh, me personally, I some weeks ago I was in uh, writing some mails with him and uh, we try to, to keep it, but uh, of course, I think we, we have the doubt, the, the duty to continue to work together. Um, even if for a, a certain time, the Patriarchate of Moscow will leave. Uh, we hope that uh, we will find a solution on our internal Orthodox problems and that we can bring them back to the dialogue because we want to do that in common. It's our duty to have a common expression of the Orthodox Church. And uh, so in common also to remain in a dialogue with our fellow Christians from the other churches and here with the Anglicans. Would you like to add something from your side, uh, Reverend Clark? 
Well, no, I, I, I think probably it has been answered by um, Metropolitan um, Athenagoras. Uh, just on a lighter note, he, he mentioned, and this is more informally, he mentioned our uh, excellent uh, member from the uh, Russian, uh, the Moscow pa Patriarchate, and the irony was that inevitably um, he and I, I would find ourselves on the same side, sometimes against the, the rest of the entire commission. So we reckon there was definitely an, an Irish-Russian alliance. So I must say I would be delighted uh, to see uh, the, the Moscow Patriarchate um, able to send him back to us again. But that had better not be reported, as that would probably guarantee he would not be back with us again. I, I see two, um, two hands, so to say, and I, I would collect the questions now. Uh, first, Nikos Kosmidis, please. Uh, greetings from uh, Northeast Greece. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this meeting and for uh, being able to participate in this very interesting discussion. Uh, forgive me if my question somehow may sound uh, a bit critical. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it may be also be a result of uh, misunderstanding from my behalf, but somehow I feel that your focus, the fact that both eminences focused on how we made, uh, made until now the dialogue, uh, this technicality maybe is also because we uh, understand that uh, the process of the dialogue is not going as we would like, or that uh, the way we have done dialogue not only bilateral, but also humanitarian dialogue until today, somehow uh, seems not to be effective anymore. And I'm referring both to the fact that, as you both mentioned, there, there are differences and now difficulties, new difficulties among uh, the two churches, but we also deal uh, with internal difficulties, both the Orthodox and the uh, Anglican uh, churches. And uh, we also see that the dialogues through commissions and documents uh, not to mention the fact that uh, somehow the Great and Holy Council of Crete for many Orthodox was not what we hoped to be. Uh, it was a failure uh, in a way, uh, the fact that six decades of dialogue happened and eventually the Orthodox Church didn't uh, manage to uh, come in a common agreement on, on basic things. Uh, we see also the same happening now internally in the Anglican Church. What is the effect of these now internal problems in, uh, in the dialogue that we are facing uh, right now? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Before you answer, I would like to give um, the possibility to ask his question, Archbishop Michael. Well, it's not irrelevant to what Nikos Kosmidis uh, said in part of his contribution. I was simply going to record that while it's been very sad that Russia and also Bulgaria, for that matter, um, have either not been present or have felt a bit impaired in their presence, um, I was going to own up really to the fact that there have been Anglican absences as well. And even though we don't do it on a strictly provincial and geographical basis, nevertheless, there are some significant areas of Anglican presence in the world that have been excluded by um, by Anglican authority as collateral damage in other internal arguments. I mean, for example, the entire Anglican Episcopal Church, properly so-called, of the United States of America, and more besides. I don't actually myself, Nikos, think that that is a fatal wounding, but it is a wounding. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, um, please go ahead and, if you like, answer the, both of the, the question and, and the comment. Um, Metropolitan, His Eminence. Yes. Thank you very much for the, the questions that are related, I would say. Um, I think uh, that, unfortunately, speaking from the Orthodox churches, uh, ecumenism and the dialogue is not, uh, for a, a lot of churches, not a priority anymore. And this is a, a very big problem. 
we see that uh, local Orthodox churches, they live much more on their selves. And they, they uh, live in a kind of ghetto and uh, thinking that they are right and no, nobody else is uh, right and, and so on. We can see it uh, also internally in the Orthodox Church because I live in the heart of the Orthodox diaspora where we have uh, several bishops having so-called dioceses, the one above the other, the so-called problem of the Orthodox diaspora. There is no will to solve this problem. There are the nation, national, nationalistic ideas who uh, reign and uh, not, not the will to, to, to work together to solve our problems. So if we have already this kind of problems, uh, then we will have them also in our relationship with the other churches, in the dialogue with the other, other churches. So I fully agree that uh, we, we live in a period that it is very difficult uh, to promote ecumenism. And therefore, I would say that uh, our churches have to invest in a young generation of theologians and uh, clergymen uh, in order to be ready um, also to take part at the every dialogue. We have the Institute of Bosset. We could send much more Orthodox to this Institute and to, to help them to understand that we need to be in a dialogue with the other churches and that we need to work for the um, how to say the uh, re-establishment of the, the uh, visual unity of our churches. Uh, just really to um, perhaps add to what Archbishop Michael was saying, uh, I think that the difficulties that each of the communions face is that whereas I think uh, it's not up to me to judge the Orthodox uh, patriarchates, it is more in ecclesiological differences. I think in the Anglican community it is much more to do with the presenting issue of sexuality and therefore I would be inclined to agree with Archbishop Michael that um, it is a wound, it's a wound that may fester, it's a wound that will not be healed quickly, but um, just to remember that the Anglican communion Council, the, the ACC, does actually permit all the different provinces to attend. So there hasn't been a total exclusion of communion for any churches. However, it was felt that only some of the provinces should really um, send people, if you like, or be included in the ecumenical dialogues. Now that may be unwise, it may be foolish, but it was a sensitivity that I think was felt by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but in mm -hmm. fact, none of the provinces are excluded from the ACC as it's known. Um, although some choose to exclude themselves, but none are excluded from that, if that gives any explanation. Yes, I thank you very much. I, I would very much like to stay um, and deepen this discussion because those are challenges which we are all facing um, in ecumenism. But since I'm the advocate of the program, uh, we have to move on. And so we now come to, to the second part of our webinar. Uh, the already mentioned joint statement stewards of creation, a hope-filled ecology, or as it is also called Canterbury statement, uh, published last year. Uh, I do not want to, to preempt the presentations and would therefore like to mention here only two aspects um, that caught my eye and which from my point of view make the document most interesting. On the one hand, the statement shows continuity with the previous statements to which the document reverts several times. And this seems to me important because it shows that it is not an attempt to take up ecological issues only for reasons of a, so to say, superficial kind of up-to-dateness. And on the other hand, it is not only a text that reads well in itself, 
but it is also accompanied by prayers from both traditions, which show the close link between theology and liturgy, and which are very ele uh, elevating. Thus, at least for me, this statement reveals once again the dialogues must not be judged only by whether mutual recognition of ministries has taken place and whether the joint celebration of the Eucharist is possible or not. Dialogues are valuable in themselves as places of better acquaintance and deeper understanding, and also as a witness to the world that here are different Christian traditions which are uh, engaged in conversation and which might arrive at important theological insights for which they stand together as Christian church. So we can be, I say, I, I would think very expectant of what awaits us today. But first, let me introduce the speakers. Um, we start with, um, or I start uh, with uh, Reverend Dr. William Adam. Um, he is a priest of the Church of England and since two, uh, 2019 director of Unity, Faith and Order for the Anglican Communion. Since he has been appointed Deputy Secretary General of the Anglican Communion, he will step down as ecumenical advisor to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, as which he was serving in the last years and will be fully engaged as Director of Unity, Faith and Order. And in the International Commission, he is serving now as co-secretary from the Anglican side. And the next speaker then will be Father Christos Christakis. Uh, he was born in Greece and has studied in Greece and England. Now he serves at the Initiation Greek Orthodox Church in Buffalo and teaches their history of the Eastern Orthodox Church at Canisius College. He has been, we have already heard, um, co-secretary of the International Commission since um, Adam was a baby. That is uh, 1994, first under the chairmanship of Metropolitan John of Pergamon, then under the chairmanship of Metropolitan Callistus of uh, Diocleia, and now under the chairmanship of Metropolitan Athenagoras. It is a great pleasure to have you here today. And now please, um, Reverend Dr. William Adam, we like to hear your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Vassmort. Um, it's good to be with you. Uh, I haven't been involved since Adam was a boy. Uh, in fact, I am the newest member of, uh, of the team, um, having come into this particular process right at the last minute. But in this section, um, I shall place the agreed statement, Stewards of Creation, a Hope-Filled Ecology, in its context. We've heard already about previous statements of the International Commission for the Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue. I hope to place this current document on its foundation in the Buffalo Statement, and then to look forward or outward to current wider discussions on ecology and climate change. Father Christos will talk to us about the content of the statement itself. Anglicans and Orthodox are involved in a range of bilateral dialogues. So when we talk to each other, we do so in the context of other conversations that we are having. Whilst there are different people around the different dialogue tables, nevertheless, both Anglicans and Orthodox are in dialogue with, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation. For Anglicans, both the Catholic and Orthodox dialogues are now looking at ethical issues, but the two dialogues have come to this from different directions. ARCIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, which I'm also co-secretary, started its third phase with an agreed statement on ecclesiology. Walking Together on the Way was the title of that statement, known as the Erfurt Statement after the German city where it was concluded. And this statement compares and contrasts Catholic and Anglican church structures and ecclesial identity, 
specifically on the relationship between the church at local, regional and universal levels. There is much in common, but also real differences. There are points at which it is suggested the two, com two communions might learn from each other. Now, the second part of ARCHIC 3 is looking at ethics and particularly at ethical decision making, where, how and by whom is right ethical teaching declared. All of this, the church, local and universal and right ethical teaching, are drawn from the mandate laid down by Archbishop Rowan Williams and Pope Benedict XVI that set Archic on the journey of its third phase. By contrast, the Anglican Orthodox dialogue started not with ecclesiology, but with theological anthropology. The last agreed statement was entitled In the Image and Likeness of God, a hope-filled anthropology, and is also known as the Buffalo Statement after the city in New York State, where that report was finalized in 2015 and where Father Christos will be speaking to us from this morning for him. The Buffalo Statement sets the human person within the wider creation. Humanity is part of God's creation, a part in the ecology and mystery of creation. As part of the whole creation, human beings sing the praise of the creator. But human beings are made in the image of that creator created according to the image and likeness of God. The statement says that, and I quote, this entails a special position of the human being within the created order, given by God for the common good of all creation. And of course, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, is Christ himself. Whilst human beings are part of and not separate from creation, the Buffalo Statement refers to the concept of dominion found in Genesis chapter 1. In a theme taken up by the Canterbury Statement, a comparison is made between dominion and domination, a wordplay that works well in English. The language of the statement, this dominion is not to be understood as arbitrary and tyrannical domination. This theological and anthropological assertion is found in many Orthodox and Anglican responses to the present climate emergency. Dominion is understood best in the language of stewardship and responsibility, rather than domination of the rest of creation, which is sin. Buffalo refers to this in the memorable phrase of a dominated and exploited creation being treated as an it rather than a vow. An as yet unpublished Anglican text on theological anthropology puts it like this. Does dominion sanction our treatment of nature as if it were simply a warehouse of resources for our use and exploitation? Quite the reverse. In the ancient world, an important aspect of being an icon of the divine was to be the divine representative on earth. In the context of Genesis, this means sharing God's nurturing of creation. In being given dominion over the earth, human beings are to participate in God's providential care of creation, ensuring its fruitfulness and protecting its beauty. As an image of God, humanity is to till the earth and order and name creation. This implies that humanity as an icon of the creator within creation bears a moral responsibility towards the care and cultivation of God's good earth. That is not from an uh, agreed statement, that's from an Anglican only statement. So the Anglican Orthodox dialogue comes to the study of creation with a clear understanding of the place and human being of human beings within God's creation. And it is on the basis of this agreed anthropology that the ecology text that Father Christos will talk to us about is built. I'm now going to look at the wider context of the Ecology Report and how it is a text very much for our time. It does not need to be repeated that matters of damage of and care for the climate are important in the world today. The Ecumenical Patriarch is All Holiness Bartholomew, following on from and building on the work of his predecessors, has made the environment a key part of his ministry. 
He has taught, written and preached on the topic frequently and has been dubbed the Green Patriarch in some quarters. Likewise, the Anglican Communion has been keen to raise the profile of care for creation. In 1990, as we read in the Canterbury Statement, the Anglican Communion's four marks of mission were amended to become five. The fifth mark was to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. The phase integrity of creation can be seen in the earlier work of the World Council of Churches, which set up the work stream Justice, Peace and the Integrity of Creation from the Vancouver Assembly in 1983. And the link between creation and justice and peace is a strong one, which has been made elsewhere. It is a fact, picked up in numerous reports, including the Canterbury Statement, that climate change disproportionately affects the poorer members of society. Those who live closest to the land are most affected by damage to the land. Those who live closest to the water are most affected by the rise in sea levels or the increase in marine pollution. This year, the next conference of the parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the 26th COP, as it is called, will take place in Glasgow, in Scotland. This is a significant gathering that should have been last year at the fifth anniversary of COP21 in Paris in 2015. It was in Paris uh, that the um, conference set up the landmark Paris Agreement. The Archbishop of Canterbury addressed a meeting of faith leaders looking towards COP26 just the other week. He made clear the social aspects of climate change and noted that people with power to make a difference will be present in Glasgow. He said, those with power to affect change will need to balance that power with their responsibility. In the Bible's accounts of the creation of the world, God gives humans dominion over the earth. But replacing dominion with domination is a false theology and a sin. We should look instead to Jesus' words that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. As the Anglican Communion's fifth mark of mission puts it, to serve the earth, not enslave it. The theological assertions of the Christian faith about the relationship between God, the creator, and creation, including human beings, are at the basis of the Christian response to the earth, its creatures, its climate, and its fragility. The present report, building on previous agreements, shows significant convergence between Orthodox and Anglicans on this important issue, where for many years we have common cause, made common cause in the world that God made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and now I hand over to, um, I can't see him right now, but um, to Father Christos. Thank ah, you. There you go. Yes, thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Um, yes, I will, uh, I will try briefly to um, give you a review of uh, the content of this statement and uh, continuing on, on what um, uh, Father Adam uh, just said. Um, so the statement um, uh, has six uh, sections and I will briefly go through them. The first one establishes the goodness of creation uh, and actually builds upon the concept of uh, the world as a sacrament. Uh, Anglicans and Orthodox uh, have affirmed and have spoken about it, uh, a sacramental universe. Uh, it is a term that is used by Anglicans like Archbishop William Temple and by Orthodox like Father Alexander Schmemann and Metropolitan John Jesus of Pergamon. And this means that in nature we find God. Of course, this is scriptural. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, as we see in the Psalms. So creation in this first section is seen as truly sacramental. 
because the whole earth is full of God's glory. Uh, in, in other words, the environment is declared as one aspect of God's glorious and beloved creation. And this builds upon previous statements, um, the Cyprus statement, the Dublin and Greek statement also uh, affirm this belief of Orthodox and Anglicans that creation continues to reveal the divine intention. Uh, so in this first chapter, first section of, of, the, of the statement, this idea of is very strong uh, and central the creation, the idea of creation as divine self-expression. The creation is a divine work of art, a reflection of the glory of God. For that reason, our Orthodox and Anglicans say together that we must recover reverence for the earth and the resources of the earth and to treat the earth no longer as a commodity to be exploited, but as a divine gift on which we depend. So that's the first chapter and the first, the first section of the statement. Uh, the earth creation is a gift uh, that it needs to uh, not be exploited, but uh, protected. Then in the second uh, section, the second chapter, the idea uh, is presented uh, and this move from dominion to stewardship. Actually, this is the title of the second chapter, from dominion to stewardship. Of course, this is based on uh, the Genesis account um, and uh, the creation, where the creation of humankind according to the imams and likeness involves dominion as we see in Genesis 1.28. However, as uh, Dr. Adam uh, said just a few minutes ago, this dominion in the text it's stressed that cannot be understood as domination, but it is a dominion according to the image of God himself. And we know that God is loving and compassionate. So the dominion in this sense, in the, in the text, it's a, a dominion which humans are entrusted. And this dominion signifies humility and service. Uh, so there is this aspect of responsibility the human responsibility of service towards creation. Um, also in that second section, this idea is developed further. Um, uh, it is stressed that our true response, the true response of humankind to God's calling includes three, and three things, protecting the dignity of all life, caring for the created order and aspiring to holiness. And these three are connected. They are not separated, but they, they are really interconnected. We are, viewed to call, to call, we are called to view the created order as a subject rather than an object, the text says. And this subject is in need of protection. We need to approach creation in love as a gift to ourselves to, and to others. So this, in, in this second section of, of the document, uh, this idea and this call to move from dominion to a stewardship of the earth uh, is, is presented. Um, we need to approach creation in love as a gift to ourselves and to others. Uh, it is stressed in the document. Uh, in the third section, in the third, I'm going to rather quickly through because I want to give you a, a, a view of the entire document. Uh, in the third chapter, or third section, uh, now, now we'll move from stewardship to priesthood. And that's a very uh, a beloved, uh, I will say, subject uh, of the Orthodox and the Anglicans. Um, of course, we know that it is Christ in whom all creation is held together and has been reconciled. So in, the, in this section, it is affirmed that through the life of Christ and the sacramental life, all humanity together with the whole creation is called to participate in God's saving action. So here we have Anglicans and Orthodox 
proclaiming this priestly vocation liturgically. And um, these, there are prayers during the celebration of the Holy Eucharist as, as the preparation of the gifts that stress this idea, both in the Orthodox and the Anglican uh, tradition. This, uh, there is this sense that creation is sacred and it's a gift. Um, the, a very important point in this chapter mentions this, the prayer from the great blessing of the waters on the Feast of Theophany, when the priest says, great art thou, O Lord, and marvelous are your works. And no speech is sufficient to sing the praises of your wonders. This sense that the creation is sacred and a gift. Uh, but, um, and this is something that builds again on the Cyprus document and on the Buffalo document. Um, where humans are priests of creation. That's why we say we're moving from the idea of the stewardship of the earth to the idea of the priesthood. We are all priests of creation. Um, we have a responsibility and we will fill our true vocation as persons, exercising our royal priesthood, all of us, when we offer the creation back to the creator in thanksgiving. So this is the idea that we all are uh, priests of creation and we offer the creation back to our creator. Um, so this constitutes the third section of, of the document, moving from stewardship to priesthood. Then in the fourth section, um, there is a review uh, of, the, of the subject, creation and ecology in the patristic age and in church history. And in that chapter, uh, there is a, a mention of uh, the ch church fathers uh, and, um, uh, and, the, and their ideas uh, on creation. Um, of course, uh, the beginning is always the biblical understanding, uh, which was against the influence of Gnosticism we know that Gnosticism was strong in the, in the early, early centuries and Gnosticism opposed uh, the spiritual reality from the created order, the created reality. But the, the, the biblical understanding was against this and the fathers of the church built on this. Uh, Maximus the Confessor uh, was one also who said, who mentioned that the, the disorder that we have nowadays in creation um, and all that comes with that disorder, pain, suffering, loss, waste, is not really a characteristic of creation itself, but is due to human sin. And it is introduced by disobedience, by disobedience to the divine intention of the creator. So there are many early theologians who affirm this idea. Uh, and... Um, this is, uh, this is developed by later church fathers. It's interesting also one point in the document that I want to mention to you is when uh, the, the church fathers were also concerned how, about how creation could be made into a God to be worshiped. So, and we have fathers like Saint Simeon the New Theologian seeing this as the ultimate pollution of the earth when we make creation into a God and we worship creation. And this happens nowadays, unfortunately. Um, but in this section, there are, there is, of course, um, uh, there is reference to the saints and to great ascetics. Uh, there are many examples in both traditions, uh, in Eastern and Western Orthodox and Anglican, uh, of saints who experienced moments in which peace was regained with God. Uh, there are more, there were many stories of the, in the lives of the saints when there is this unity with the created order, with nature, with the animals. And also the a section of the, of the chapter is um, dedicated to the, to the ascetics, to the great ascetics in the history of the church. Um, and the ascetics were an example of the people who regain peace with God in a sense, they experienced a return to paradise. 
where humankind and nature were at peace. So for us, they're a great example. Uh, it is an interesting point in the document in that chapter when it is referenced that animals would approach an ascetic as to their master and wag their heads and tails and lick his hands and feet for the smell coming from him that same scent that exalted from Adam before the fall when they were gathered together before him and he gave them names in paradise. So in this chapter there are many and this is a very encouraging of course chapter uh, because we have our fathers and the uh, and our saints really pointing us to the true relationship between uh, human, uh, humans and creation. Um, the, the fifth uh, section of the document uh, deals with the modern engagement of our churches, of our two churches. Um, and uh, we know that both Orthodox and Anglicans have in recent decades engaged even more deeply with issues of the environment and ecology. Uh, there is, we we'll go back uh, to a commitment through the WCC in 1983 in the Vancouver Assembly uh, in the program on justice, peace and integrity of creation. But most importantly, we know that since the 1980s, the ecumenical patriarchate on the Orthodox side has led thinking about environmental issues. We know that the late ecumenical patriarch Dimitrios in 1989 instituted the World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation, celebrated on September 1st, which is the beginning of the Orthodox ecclesiastical year. The Green Patriarch, His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, has played a fundamental role in the document in this chapter and in throughout the document and through our whole work have, uh, have recognized this, the leadership and the inside of, of the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. So uh, in this chapter, of course, there's reference to the symposia uh, of, that the ecumenical patriarchate had, uh, had organized in the past. Uh, also uh, a reference to the Holy and Great Synod of the Orthodox Church in Crete in 2016, where there was a reference, clear, clear reference on, the, on, on, this, on this subject. And on the other side, on the Anglican side, and I know Reverend Adam mentioned some of this, we have, uh, uh, it's interesting that there is a balance, there is, there is, there is participation in both sides. Uh, many Lambeth conferences uh, have dealt with uh, this issue, the relation of humanity to the created world. Um, of course, there was a mention already about the the Anglican Consultative Council and the amendment of the four marks of mission by adding the fifth mark about the integrity of creation. Um, and uh, also the present Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Justin Welby also has, a, has a, a, an important role in, uh, in uh, declaring um, the proper relation to our environment. So this chapter deals with all of these, our modern engagement of our two churches uh, in, and really uh, demonstrates that we're not really talking only about theology, but we see that our two churches really taking action, uh, really leadership in the Christian world on these issues. And then on the final sixth section, sixth chapter, uh, we become a little bit more practical. Uh, we have all the foundation of the five previous sections the actual actually the final chapter is uh, is uh, titled how then should we live because we said what we said but how then should we live now and there uh, the document and the commission provides three attitudes wonder gratitude and restraint and i think these are beautiful uh, wonder wonder at the beauty of god's creation but this wonder needs to motivate us. The, the, the document actually gives us action. On the issue of wonder, it says that we need to be motivated because we are filled with wonder to protect and conserve the environment, uh, to prevent pollution, to press for legislation that promotes the, the uh, protection of our planet. The second is gratitude to God 
which again, gratitude to God for, for, for the richness of, of, our, of, the, of creation that is a gift to us, which again should motivate us to appreciate this treasure, to understand that we are priests of creation, as I mentioned earlier. And then the third and final um, point, this sense of restraint under God, which should motivate us to recover the insights of asceticism in healing the wounds in a relationship with the environment, witness of how to care for the environment. So this final section uh, gives us again these three directions of, on the question, how then should we live? And that's the, that's the, that's the, again, that was a very quick, uh, and I apologize for maybe being a little bit um, uh, broken in pieces, but this is, this is, I wanted to give you, and I read a few sentences, I want to give you a very brief overview of the document. Of course, I will encourage all of, all of you to, to get it, to buy it, to get it, and to study it, because it's a great document. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you very much um, for, for both uh, presentations and uh, for the introduction in, in this um, very important paper. We have now left just a couple of minutes, so maybe for one or two questions. So if you have um, a question, please go ahead and let us know. Yes, Metropolitan Zerafim. Yes, my question is to the two uh, bishops who, who chair the dialogue and to the two secretaries. Um, after the publication of the last statement on ecology, we have any replies, any comments, any reviews on behalf of churches and theologians uh, from the ecumenical family? Mm -hmm. Any news? Thank you. Yes, please, um, His Eminence, Metropolitan Athenagoras. I did not hear the, the question. Oh, it, it was a question of reception of uh, any kind of responses already. On, on the document? Ah, yeah, no, we, we have not yet because uh, we could not gather, as uh, Metropolitan Seraphim knows very well, we could not gather. We had uh, just one uh, meeting uh, by Zoom uh, last uh, October because we had to. Talk. So we, we did not receive any news about the reception of the document, not yet. I think that will be shared uh, when we will be together with all the, the members of the commission and the Metropolitan Sarah Finke is uh, one of them. So he will be there and he will hear it. <laughs> okay. Um, I, yes. I, think, yeah, I, can, I can just say um, something about this. It's, um, it's still quite a new document. Um, there are details in the chat of where you can get it. It can be downloaded as a PDF from the Anglican Communion website. And it's also available from a number of different uh, national uh, platforms of Amazon as a pre print on demand document. So you can actually uh, get a, a physical book. Here, here, it, here it is. Um, and that's available in the uh, United States and Canada, um, UK, various different parts of Europe, Australia and Canada uh, from Amazon print on demand. Um, it will be one of those, one of the documents that is in the queue to be looked at by the Inter-Anglican Standing Commission on Unity, Faith and Order ahead of the next Anglican Consultative Council. The next mm -hmm. ACC meeting will be in um, the spring of 2023. And um, so it's one of the documents in a quite a large pile now waiting to be received officially in the Anglican Communion uh, and um, will be presented, I'm sure, to the different Orthodox jurisdictions in the appropriate way. But if people do have any um, comments uh, and um, commentaries, then um, please do send them in to Christos or, or to me. We're uh, 
I'm sure our doc, our um, uh, contact details are available. Mine certainly are on the uh, Anglican Communion website. Yes, then then I like to conclude uh, looking at the importance of the issue. Uh, I think we can only wish, uh, especially this statement, uh, to have a broad and very wide reception and, and also discussion, and maybe not only in, in the communion of churches, but also worldwide, so to say. Um, Yes, once again, I thank the speakers for their contribu uh, contribution and, uh, of course, all participants uh, for the discussion and um, the attention. I part with all good wishes and look forward to seeing you again at the next webinar, which will come soon then. Goodbye. Carl. Bye. Thank you also on behalf of uh, the Permanent Secretariat of Faith and Order of WCC to all participants and uh, the speakers, first of all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.